Well, good evening, and welcome to Dana Hall School. I'm Catherine Bradley, head of school here, and we welcome you to the forum. This evening, we'll be talking, having a conversation on girls and stress. Everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> so this evening completes our fourth year of this program called the forum. And since the beginning, we've focused on a variety of topics related to girls. Um, some of the things that we've included are girls in the di di digital age, girls in today's campus culture, the evolving role of youth and high school sports for girls, and girls in the Me Too era. This evening, we're gonna turn our attention to a topic of special relevance to all of us who work with and care for girls in this complex and dynamic climate, a conversation about girls and stress. And we're very happy to have such an esteemed panel here with us tonight. I'd like to introduce the moderator for tonight's event, Dr. Rebecca Platt. Yeah, please come on in and, and feel free to find a comfortable seat. So Dr. Platt um, works here in our middle school. She's our middle school counselor. So she's working primarily with girls in grades five through eight. And she works with our Dana Hall faculty to help foster growth in the, for them, help them foster growth in the middle school years. And she also serves as a counselor and is on our counseling staff. She's also a facilitator in our forum curriculum, which provides age-appropriate health and character education at all grade levels. Rebecca has held school psychologist positions at the Advent School, Lincoln Sudbury Regional High School, and Columbia Grammar, Grammar and Preparatory School in New York City. She earned her BA from University of Michigan, MGO Blue, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> and both a master's and doctoral degree from Yeshiva University. Welcome. Thanks so much, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's great to see such a big group of parents, educators, community members, um, and we really welcome you to Dana Hall. So as Catherine said, the forum is a symposium series designed to examine a topic of particular relevance to girls and girls' education. We are all here because we care about girls and young women, and we're all observing stress. While girls are aspiring to even more ambitious academic and pro professional goals than ever, they're also reporting higher levels of stress and a stronger reaction to stress than their male counterparts. We want to explore the root causes of this spike and whether fears about an anxiety epidemic are a myth or a reality that's being borne out in the research and in clinical practice. Our talented panel tonight uh, will share information about anxiety across the developmental span and discuss nuances particular to girls and to high achieving communities. In addition, we want to create a framework for distinguishing normal healthy stress from clinical anxiety. And finally, and perhaps more importantly, tonight's discussion will provide practical strategies for parents, educators, and clinicians in supporting girls who are confronting and struggling with these issues. So let me introduce our amazing panel. Uh, Dr. Robin Cook Nobles is the Director of Counseling Services at the Stone Center at Wellesley College down the road. She and her colleagues offer a continuum of counseling services that promote wellness, balance, acceptance of self, and connection to others. Before coming to Wellesley College over 25 years ago, Dr. Cook Nobles worked at BU and at Howard University. Dr. Cook Nobles earned her undergraduate degree from Boston College, her master's from Teachers College at Columbia University, and a doctoral degree from Boston University. Uh, we also are thrilled to welcome Dr. Christina Dolce. Dr. Dolce is a clinical and educational psychologist at McLean Hospital, where she's the co-creator of the Dialectical Behavioral Therapy Child Track at McLean. She's an instructor at Harvard Medical School. She has a private practice in Boston, where I've referred many people, focusing on addressing anxiety and mood disorders and helping families navigate the challenges of childhood and adolescence. Dr. Dolce earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Connecticut, her master's from Northeastern University, and her doctoral degree from the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology, now known as William James University. And 
lastly, we're delighted to welcome Renee Spencer. Dr. Spencer is a professor in the Human Behavior Department at Boston University. Her research interests include youth mentoring, adolescent development, and gender. Her research is focused on the relational processes at work in more and less successful youth mentoring relationships. She was a co-investigator in the study 21st Century Athenas, Aligning Achievement and Well-Being, a year and a half long study in which our Dana Hall girls were participants. She earned her undergraduate degree from Austin College, her master's from the University of Texas at Austin, and her doctoral degree from Harvard University. So we welcome all of our panelists. Um, so let's start with what the research is saying and delve a little bit into um, whether we are defining anxiety differently and that's why there, we're understanding there to be sort of a spike or whether there is a true sort of epidemic of anxiety and if so, to what you and the research attribute that. Um, well, so good evening. Can you all hear me? I want to make, I was having mic trouble earlier. I want to make sure you all can hear me. Okay, great. Um, uh, good evening. And um, I think it's a really important question. I, would, I don't know if I would call it an epidemic. I'll leave it to my clinical colleagues to be able to make that discernment and sort of determine what they're seeing in their practice. But we're def there definitely is evidence that there's an uptick in, in anxiety and all forms of it, sort of everything from anxiety disorders to um, young people and adults, for that matter, reporting high levels of anxiety. And I brought my little cheat sheet, I have to confess, because I can't remember numbers <laughs> in my life, and I want to give you the real numbers and not some I just make up or think I remember. But um, to say that, um, well, for one thing, I think it's important to know that anxiety is actually the most common mental health condition amongst young people. Um, and so some of the other um, issues that we see come along not too far behind, but an anxiety is out in front, and um, particularly among 13 to 18 year olds. But it does affect girls disproportionately, like other things affect boys, but anxiety is something that does affect girls disproportionately. We see higher rates. So in kind of the general um, prevalence kinds of studies, you see about 38% of females reporting some form of anxiety in adolescent age range and about 26% of males. So that's a significant difference um, reported there. Um, we've also seen an increase in anxiety amongst college students, which I think is important, and maybe um, Robin will be speaking to that a bit later, um, for males and females, but again, the rate is steeper uh, for young women that we're seeing. And to give you some sense of this, there's a National College Health Assessment where they're collecting data from institutes that participate in this um, study, and they've been tracking some of these things over time. So in 2010, 54% of college females reported feeling overwhelming anxiety sometime in the last 12 months. This increased to 60% in 2014 and to a whopping 70% in 2018. So what, you know, this sense that things are on the rise, it is true, we're seeing, seeing reports of anxiety being on the rise. It was, there was also an increase in our young men, but at a, at a really different rate. They started at 38% in 2010. That did move to 42% in 2014 and 49% in 2018. So it's on the rise in our young men as well, but not at the rate that we're seeing in our young women. So this is of concern, I think. I think interestingly, and kind of leading into, I think, some other questions that we'll get into, um, is, you know, we, what we see amongst young people is also reflected in adults. The American Psychological Association did a really interesting study on stress and they looked at teens and parents and adults in terms of stress levels and seeing some sort of parallels there where adults are also reporting upticks in their feelings of anxiety and interesting parallels there too where what do adults say their stresses are about? They're about finances and work. And what do young people say their stresses are about? School, that's their version of work. So school and family finances actually are kind of the leading areas of anxiety um, reported by our young people. Um, so, so some interesting parallels there in terms of it's not just our young people, um, it's kind of all of us, and I think that that has implications for our conversation tonight. Great, thank you. So that's a perfect sort of bridge to hear from you, Robin, in terms of what things are looking like. I mean, hearing that 70% of students are in college are reporting overwhelming anxiety. So um, we'd love to learn from you a little bit about sort of how this plays out at the post-secondary level, particularly in a high achieving community, particularly from, you know, at Dana Hall wanting to learn what it looks like at an all-women's college. Yes. Well, we inherit your students. <laughs> 
so yes, um, previously, I would say like 10 years ago, depression was the primary clinical diagnosis for women, and we would see that as well. About four or five years ago, the statistics for college students shifted, and for women, anxiety became and then depression. Before, men have been a, had been anxious more, uh, at the, always at the higher level, but then the women depression went down, anxiety for the female students went up about three or four years ago. And uh, the, Associ the Association of University College Counseling Center Directors, that comes from their data. Mm -hmm. So um, now, so I agree with that. I also think that um, the fam what's happening in the family matters. So fear and anxiety around what's happening in the family, students carry that. So that also resonates with what we see clinically. The other thing is you have anxiety, depression, and then relationships are very important. And then coming out of the Stone Center relational model, uh, re uh, relationships are central in terms of uh, students feeling connected and feeling affirmed and feeling validated and all that. But there's, there's more like a mutuality that needing support but also needing to give Mm -hmm. So back and forth, not just being on the receiving end or et cetera. So then the, the, peer, the peer matters. But then at, for high achieving uh, students, you also have high expectations of achievement. And so then it creates an interesting situation in that you have this relational need, but you also have the need to achieve too. So that creates uh, a lot of stress. Um, we have to look at the impact of trauma in our world. It's a lot of trauma, and students come to school having had traumatic experiences, you know, uh, knowing peers who have struggled with suicidal ideation or completed suicides. You hear about all the things in schools that are happening that's creating fears and anxiety. So you hear students wanting to be safe and be in a safe place. But there's a lot of trauma in the world, and also because the younger generation are on the internet, they have a different experience in terms of the role of social media, and the role of technology, and having such quick access to everything that's happening in the world. Also, the world has shrunk because a lot of their peers you have, we have high levels of international students, students from all over the country. Um, and so you add that also to knowing different people with different experiences and all of that. So um, there's a lot to navigate. There are a lot of benefits, huge numbers of benefits around diversity and choices and options and, and all of that. So thank you. Fascinating. And so looking at sort of where kind of things start, Christina, can you talk a little bit about um, like the starting at childhood and what you're seeing in your office and sort of, you know, before students get there, get to college, how parents know to distinguish like healthy anxiety or healthy stress and worry you know, it's normal for kids and adults to feel <laughs> nervous or have a tummy ache before you try something new or you're having a big transition. When does that shift to become sort of clinical anxiety that needs support? And then maybe we can think a little bit about, together about like life skills in between and how people in this audience can help support girls and daughters and students to get their feeling like they have the coping skills. Can you guys hear me now better? OK. Um, so I think that's a great question. I think it's helpful to frame stress as stress can be a good thing, right? Everyone has experienced stress. 
whether it's being a new parent or learning how to drive for the first time. Do you guys remember when you first started to drive? I know I was a wreck. My parents were a wreck. Um, but stress is good because it allows for a change. It shows that we are adapting and evolving. When stress becomes problematic or when we find that it no longer benefits us, then it can lead into anxiety. And so as a clinician, some of the signs that I look for when stress becomes problematic is, has it impacted life functioning? So if we think about life, there are several different domains, relationships. So with anxiety, has the anxiety interfered with a child's ability to make friendships, to communicate with peers, to come to school. You know, oftentimes we see school refusal behaviors and a lot of avoidance in terms of you know, getting through the school door. Um, we also look at if a child has excessive worry. So anxiety as we know it is our internal alarm system and it signals for us to take action. It actually creates some safety measures for us, you know, um, flight or, or Fight. Thank you. See, the anxiety is kicking in for myself. Um, when anxiety becomes problematic, that internal alarm system becomes faulty. It's over time sending signals that you're in danger. And so that's something that we look for. You know, is a child avoiding um, their emotions? Are they avoiding certain places? Um, I also like to look at their thinking. So when we are anxious, we often have this negative track in our minds um, where we might think in extreme ways, right? This always happens, this never will happen, or there's some fortune telling or mind reading, and that's when it becomes problematic. Um, so to answer your question, I think in some, we look at functioning. You know, how is a child um, managing at home, school, relationships? You know, are there any physical ailments? Often anxiety can um, come out in physical ways. Great, thank you. And so just to put out to everybody, um, that said, what are ways that um, parents and teachers and community members can help support girls specifically to develop healthy coping mechanisms, both girls for whom, you know, they have their you know, relatively easily able to navigate those challenges and girls for whom it's much trickier and it feels maybe difficult for the parent or teacher to understand why this young woman is feeling so worried about whatever stressor. I, I just want to just share a little something here. At uh, very competitive schools, the students are at the top at their high school. Now they're at college. So they're all number one valedictorians. So that's a huge transition because all of a sudden they feel average. There's nothing average about them. But in relation to their other peers, you know, it could feel like a drop in status, mm -hmm. right? Changing your identity. Shit major, and we all know that for adolescent development, part of their task is around identity. Who am I, love, work? That's, that's their task, that they're, what they're supposed to be doing. But now all of a sudden they work so hard to get there, and everybody around them is also number one, or number, we're number one or number two. So that's a, that can be a shock, you know, and you hear them coming in talking about that experience. The other thing, too, and you all may want to do this, you could just Google it, but, you know, the cultural context. So if you Google, like, the millennials, you need to Google the millennials <laughs> because we all grow up or grew up in a cultural context, social, politically, and so... What I experienced growing up in my development is different than what my child experienced, right? And so all of that is interacting. 
So the millennials have been taken care of very well. You all have a, done a very good job taking <laughs> care of them. But not letting them fall and scuff their knees like maybe the baby boomers did or the other generation. <laughs> so I think learning to self-soothe and learning to deal with failure and getting back up and doing it again, that might be getting in the way of being problematic um, a little bit. Because being able to manage conflict, being able to make decisions is very critical. So, and I think uh, Stu, you can speak more to this, you know more about this than I do, but being very active, they're very active, like they're in soccer, and then they're in music, and then they're in dance, and they got all this stuff going on, and parents are managing that. They're help making these appointments and these play dates and, and making the medical appointments for them and the dental appointments. Then you get to college and somebody's expecting you to do that. <laughs> And so they don't understand that you have to make an appointment. It's not just automatic, but with parents, and it's not just. So you know, you got to explain. So my, so my answer, I had to give you all the context. So you, you've got to help them navigate a little bit, practice that a little bit, you know. So, and I think just thinking about what is the goal, the goal is that you know, part of the goal and part, you know, being a loving parent is getting them there and, and having them know that they are capable of making that appointment. So yes. I think knowing that that's in service of, you know, that, it just, it, that independence is out of love. Mm -hmm. So I think other practical strategies um, to help children cope with stress and kind of prepare them for their different transitions in lifehood um, one of the things that often is really helpful is when we know there are certain situations or triggers, triggers to stress, mm -hmm. to really preview those stressors with our children and walk them through what it would look like to cope or get through that stressor and then have them visualize like, okay, this is what it would be like if I had to give a presentation or if I had to confront your friend about conflict. And I think giving kids the tools and highlighting that this is hard and you are capable of doing this really pushes them towards not only advocating for themselves but feeling empowered and strong and then enabling them to take more initiative you know, during the college years or even high school years. So that would be one kind of strategy that I would definitely recommend. And I would put in a plug for, and communicating with the school when, if you know that something is gonna be challenging or triggering for your child and partnering so that the school can then also similarly, you know, um, help your child navigate that. Another thing that, that also I find to be helpful is when we know that our child's schedule is packed with different activities, making sure that there's scheduled time for recovery. And a recovery time essentially is that downtime, opportunities for self-care, opportunities to kind of reboot and be ready for the next demand. Because what we know is that childhood and adolescence is really challenging. There's many stressors. And sometimes we don't have enough time for ourselves. And so I think that's important. I just want to reiterate that because you know we need work gives us a sense of purpose, meaning. We don't work just to get a paycheck. It's nice to get the paycheck, but we work for fulfillment, particularly if you have a career that you have passion about. But you do need rest. You do need relaxation. Mm -hmm. You do need to dance. I tell them, go to the party. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you need to sleep, and they're not sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very grounding. Um, and uh, sometimes in counseling, particularly for students who have never had counseling before, I do a lot of psychoeducation about the body, that the body is an instrument, it's a machine, it needs certain things. 
And then at, that, at night when you're sleeping, your brain is regenerating. Mm -hmm. So you want that A, you need to get some sleep. Because it's not just a matter of remembering, but your, your brain has to be able to recall it too. You know, you, you put the knowledge in it, but you have to be able to recall it. So self-care and then nutrition and exercise mm -hmm. and taking good care of themselves. So to, um, and to give them space for that. And it's okay, you know, to take care of yourself. Because, and I say to them, I said, you know, you, you, you got to uh, be able to manage for the long run. I said, you got to be fabulous at 50, not just at, <laughs> not just at 19. <laughs> so, it, so let me ask a question about the downtime, because I work with middle school students, particularly middle school students will say, one way that they really, really like to unwind and relax and have self-care is at the end of the day, going on their phone and having, you know, just relaxing with social media or just spending time kind of like scrolling through doing whatever. And I, for parents, I think that feels really tricky to navigate because of everything we know and read about some of the adverse psychological effects of social media on self-esteem. So where, how do you see kind of media and, and technology and social media playing into anxiety and you know the downtime kind of thing? So I think for downtime, um, it, it would be definitely great for children to unplug. And I also recognize that many kids like to be online, so to speak, to feel connected with their peers. Something that I've been seeing is that with social media, it does increase anxiety where the social comparisons come into play. It can actually make you know, individuals feel much worse from what they're reporting. I don't know if anyone saw this. I just read an article. Um, I believe Instagram might be phasing out or testing an ability to turn off likes for different posts oh, good. as a way to see if um, that has any impact on an individual's self-esteem and if they feel better about themselves. Because I think that there is this idea that the more likes a post has, it does boost you up and it also can bring you down, um, unfortunately. So I think- And be so preoccupying. Exactly, especially if a child's missing out on something and it's on social media, I think that can be really devastating. Um, and it's a tool where kids are connected, and so that's important. So I think it's balancing during that recovery time, being unplugged, and then also engaging in activities that a child I would just add to that too, having a time when all of those devices go off mm -hmm. um, and they're done for the night and that there's a way to, to step away from that and to get ready and prepare for being able to sleep I think is really important. I think families have different rituals around that. I mean, I know the cable companies, now you can turn off the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't have to turn off the cellular service, but you can turn off the internet so you can control it that way. People, I know other families have rituals where everybody's phone goes in a basket in the kitchen at a certain time mm -hmm. and that's where they sit um, until the next day or, you know, ways to provide structure to help kids unplug. I think it is that balance of some kids do find it's a, it's a relaxing downtime thing, yet they also, I think, need that adult intervention and assistance with structuring that because there's just, it's endless, right? There's always more to look at. There's always something else. And to think that young people can just regulate this on their own. Um, I, I, you know, most adults are having a hard time regulating this on their own. So you know, to think that young people are going to do that, I think it's really important for us to inter, you know, get in there and help and assist with that. Um, not, you know, not to take it away when it is there are ways in which it can be helpful, but um, structure it, scaffold it, limit it. Um, when is it a good, uh, when is it a time to be able to use that as a downtime? And when is it time to unplug and think about something else for a while? And the light just from the, the phone oh, yes. interferes yeah. with the ability to go to sleep yeah. as well. But you know, it's always balanced to everything because they can download apps, soothing apps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, they can use it and as a tool. They can use it yeah. as a tool. Yeah. And uh, if they're just before an exam, if they're feeling anxious, they can use the app for their breathing and get, to get grounded mm -hmm. and, and all of that. And I think just discussion, talking, you know, just talking about life and you know um, we don't often people don't have like 
dinner meals where people decompress and talk about their days and share and, and all of that, but just talking about the reality so that they know that what, am I, what I am experiencing, other people experience, and it's a norm. It doesn't mean something's wrong with me. So just sharing more and more about life has ups and downs, mm -hmm. and there are going to be stresses, and stress is a good thing. It motivates us. Mm -hmm. How many people wouldn't go to work some days? Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sure. But, you know, it motivates you, but, you know, when it reaches a certain point, it's too much, it becomes distress, mm -hmm. and then now you're not functioning. But just to share that uh, people who are very successful and have very full lives also at different points mm -hmm. have bumps and you have seasons. Right, I think know? that modeling from parents and from teachers and other adults is so important to say, you know, this is what I experienced and I got through it or there were bumps. Mm -hmm. um, and to the cell phone, I, just another middle school plug I would say, to the point about putting your cell phones in a basket, I think that's significantly easier to start when with the sixth grader than it is with the tenth grader. So, um, you know, I, I think you know, fifth and sixth graders are very workable in order to, you know, earn technology time. They're, you know, thoughtful about what rules might make sense, and if you start those rituals early, it's easier to keep them in place rather than feeling like it's reactive. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Robin, you just mentioned the distress piece. Yes. So, can you all speak a little bit to, you know, how to help when young people are feeling that acute distress and when it, somebody is, you know, who you're trying to support is feeling sort of inconsolable or kind of in the moment really struggling? I can see it. <laughs> um, so I think the, the first most important thing to do is to listen and to validate, to acknowledge when a child is distressed, um, to acknowledge that their feelings make sense to them and what they're thinking and feeling is very real to them, even if we don't agree with it or if we don't understand. I think in general, and you probably will hear me say this a lot, I think validation is such a big intervention for families, particularly parents and also educators, as that's the entryway for, for us to be improve our communication with our children, but also to get more information. Because when we feel heard, we want to share more. And then that allows for problem solving, or at least to get through that moment. So I would say validation would be important. And communicating that this is hard, and we're going to get through this. I often like um, the idea that with the passage of time, things change. So what we know is that change is the only thing constant. And sometimes I think sharing that with a child or a teenager can be helpful because feelings change, the stress changes, and they can weather the storm. And I think that can be really empowering for families. Um, another kind of tip that I would recommend for parents is that we should respond and not react. Our kids are often looking at us to see how are we reacting to emotions. And if our child has a big emotion and we're being observed that we're afraid of their emotions, then that doesn't send the best message. And so I think we have to be calm when we respond. I often tell families, um, it's really helpful to practice mindfulness in those moments, as hard as it is to stop, take a pause, and then react, take a deep breath, that could be helpful as well. Um, but I think that's really key for the initial part of kind of addressing a meltdown or when our children are in distress. Yeah, the first thing is you have to get them grounded, you know, and you know, sometimes I'll just say breathe. Yes, yeah. Just physically, let's breathe. Let's just breathe to get in and out. Just breathe, you know. You want a glass of water. You know, just get the body mm -hmm. regulated. Um, and I think helping people know themselves, which I think is the essence of therapy. The essence, I always say this to myself. The essence of therapy is for you to get to know yourself 
better. We call it insight, better, so you know what you need, so you know what situations create anxiety for you. And so that you learn from that so that the next time you're in that situation, you know how to prepare yourself for it. So I see therapy as a lot is education about yourself and who you are and how you respond to things. Um, and I think when you're concerned about someone, speak from the I. I am concerned about you because, and be, talk about behaviors. Mm -hmm. Don't, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I think you're anxious, but I would say it seems like, like you can't sit still or you, you don't, you're not doing things you typically do. Typically you would, but you, you know, because I think then people can hear the behaviors mm -hmm. and then it's not a label or a diagnosis that people are gonna reject. Like, I'm just concerned about you um, because, you know, usually you do this, but now you're not doing that and I'm just concerned, you know, at that level and then pause and give them a moment to reflect. And then if they say, oh, nothing's wrong with me, <laughs> they say, well, okay, but I just wanted, you know, this is what I noticed. Then you circle back, mm -hmm. like how you, you know, circle back. <laughs> you, want it, you, want it, you want a creative space that it's okay to talk, it's okay to share, and then it's okay to get help. Getting help doesn't mean a parent is a failure. And, get, and, be, and being able to recognize when you need help is actually a source of strength. That's what I say. It's actually a source of strength, you know. Absolutely. And I think for parents, too, just sort of like exactly as you're saying, you know, for parents to also know, have that insight about when their children are activated, is that stressful, is that a moment that we need a deep breath or is that a moment we need to do the things you're talking about um, to come back to center? And that it's also really important if your child is struggling to get your own self-care because it is really stressful and can be worrying. And the timing, the timing, you know, so you do want to breathe yourself, you do want to process yourself with someone else and you want to pick a time that's, that they can sit down and you can sit down. You don't want to do it on the rush. You want to do it in the car while you're driving somewhere. You want to create that space in that time. Because when you do that, you're also modeling to them. And then to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Just say, well, you, you know, if you had a stressful day at work, you come home, you say, I had a stressful day at work. This is what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to warm myself a warm bath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to light myself a candle. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to soak for a moment. <laughs> you know, because I deserve, yeah. because I deserve that. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really important in terms of the modeling piece and mm -hmm. making it so it's part of kind of family life in terms of de-stressing. One thing that I think is important when we're introducing coping skills mm -hmm. to our kids, the best time to introduce those skills is when they're in that neutral state when they're not distressed, yes. so that there are opportunities for them to practice, mm -hmm. to just kind of test what works you know, in different situations so that they can more easily access those strategies or even be open to hearing like, hey, why don't we try to do ice diving or take deep breaths, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So I find that that's effective to orient and preview. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think sometimes we you know, sort of get in the habit of trying to problem solve when a kid is amped up and it doesn't feel successful and then you realize, oh, like, just like adults, you know, kids are more able to be thoughtful and reflective when the moment has passed and they're, you know, more calm and centered. The other thing, too, and you know, some, there's always a positive and a kind of a negative side, but in this day and age, a lot of, um, children have their own bedroom. And so learning how to manage space, because they may have their own bedroom at home, but they got a roommate their first year. 
And, and that room is not that big. <laughs> and you know, and now you gotta negotiate. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how to share, how to speak, how to talk about little things of conflict, like I don't want you using my deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> learn how to deal with that little yeah. tension of what if they don't like me or what if they don't speak to me so you know it's good that they have their own room that's progress the houses are bigger they have more room but back in the day when you had a sibling and you all had to work that out when you got to college you knew how to work that out you know so there's some things in progress that we take for granted that they don't have those skills because they didn't have to do it, you know. And, um, you know, um, being in the here and now with friends, being in the moment is very different than that light thing. Mm -hmm. You friended me, you, <laughs> you know. And so it gives a kind of a false sense, too. Because when you're really sad or lonely, you know, there are few, there are few people and you want to hug sometimes, you know, you, you want them in the flesh sometimes, you know. Yeah, and I think, again, just you're, you're framing it as what are the skills we're looking to build, like, in the long run and yes. what are the goals, being able to be connected to other people, be able, being able to navigate relationships, being able to share and, and self-advocate and thinking about those skills when we, if it might feel easier to bring the instrument to school or email the teacher for an assignment, it's just interesting to think about, okay, how, if, it, if I feel like I need to scaffold this now, then the next time, we need to have a conversation the next time, you know, how is my child more involved in problem solving? So um, obviously this is you know, a girls' school and part of the statistics you shared obviously suggest that this is um, you know, a bigger issue for girls and women and that that's actually been a change. So can you speak to, anyone speak to sort of why you think either um, the experience of anxiety or the manifestation of it looks different and is increasing at a quicker rate for girls and women. Maybe I'll jump in. I'll be curious um, what you'll have to say as well. I mean, I, I, I think that there's a lot of sociocultural messages um, directed at girls and women that really fuel this. And there's oh, just tremendous expectations on us. And when we did the study here um, at Dana Hall and also at the Laurel School and we interviewed girls, um, I remember distinctly sitting with the interviews and with the research assistants and sort of poring over those interviews and just feeling exhausted, listening to what the girls were describing. They felt their expectations were of them. And so we kind of coined, at that time we talked about, there was a, the talk about the perfect girl, you know, the sense that girls have to be and be perfect all the time. And that seemed amped up um, in, you know, a few years ago when we did those interviews where it felt like she had to be super girl. It wasn't just perfect girl, she had to be super girl. So the expectations were to do well in school and to be the best in the team, be the team captain, um, all the while being kind and nice to everybody and being super cheerful and happy while you're doing it and smiling and it's like it's all too much. But I think that we do, we sort of pile these expectations up on girls and women um, that are just impossible to meet. And so I think um, that's a factor that's at play and I think that girls really absorb that. I think that girls tend to be, it's a generalization, but I do think they tend to be very attuned to their relationships and to okay. what other people think of them for better and for worse. I mean, the upside of that is compassion and empathy and kindness and sort of, you know, the, the lovely things that come from, from building and having those kinds of connections and, and paying attention to what people think, you know, is, can, is, can be a really nice quality. But that very strength can work against you in when the expectations are so high and seemingly unattainable. You're acutely aware 
that you're disappointing people. You know, I think that I can, you know, give a disappointment face to my daughter, and that's probably the most, of, you know, shriveling thing I can do. Unfortunately, you know, because she will know, you know, when I'm disappointed and really um, take that in. So I think that it's, um, it's. I, I think that we, that gr the, the expectation on girls is, ju they're, it's just impossible. I don't think you could possibly live up to sort of the ideal that we put out there for what it means to be. Uh, um, a girl, and then coupling that with girls, um, you know, really attending to um, people's perceptions of them, um, trying to please adults, uh, please peers, but also please adults, I think is a real, real important factor as well, that for all of us engaging and in relationship with girls to know this, that, that they're really um, sensitized and keyed into trying to please us, and that that has some um, risks associated with it as well. So if, if we're not careful to titrate our expectations, um, they'll keep in the hunt to please us and do more and more and more. I'll just add that one of the things that was also really striking um, when we interviewed girls was the sense that um, while teachers would even say to them, now only invest X amount of time on this assignment, do no more, the girls would then see that the girl who invested three times that got the warm response from the teacher. The teacher liked that product and liked that student. And it might have been quite subtle on the, you know, it doesn't have to be holding this up as the example in front of the classroom. The girls are cued in to that response that they get. And so for all of us, you know, when you're in relationship with girls and being kind of keyed into the way that they're, they're picking up on those cues and when, the, ex, when the, the performance expectations are high, you know, they can really kick into overdrive to try to meet that and at a really unhealthy pace. So that's some of what I think drives it for girls. And so can I ask, how do we try to shift that? I know that's a very tall order, but in a, you know, as we talked about in the opening, in a community where expectations and opportunities are exciting and rich, how do we try to shift that? Anybody? <laughs> no, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess what we're all saying that there's a context to everything. Yeah. Yes. And people do not grow in isolation. I mean, um, a beautiful rose grows within context of the, the fertile ground, the sun, whatever it needs, right? So I think that um, the, you know, the first step is awareness, mm -hmm. is to uh, knowledge and awareness and then shifting your way of being. It's, it's, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process. It's going to be looking and reflecting on what, what are you doing that's assisting, what are you doing that's not. Um, and then when they dare to tell you, listen to them. Mm -hmm. And don't minimize it. Oh, not really. Oh, you can do it. No, when they dare to tell you. And some people tell you in a whisper, you know, they don't, they don't scream it out, you know. And you know, the thing is, you know, we're all human, we all make mistakes. And a lot of us have had the experience like when you think of something, you say, oh, I wish I had said something, you know, in retrospect, you can go back and say, you know what, you said this last week and I've been thinking about it. And, I don't think I gave you the right response. So I don't think that I really heard you in a way that you needed me to. I mean, to, sh to sh model that to, of correction, mm -hmm. you know, and that that's okay. And that the, the, the ground is not going to shake away just because someone goes back and corrects themselves. Because mm -hmm. correction is all about learning. It's really about assimilation and accommodation. Whenever you learn new information, your brain is kind of recategorizing it, you know? So it's no magical solutions, mm -hmm. but you can kind of address it bit by bit mm -hmm. and then get feedback all along the way, you know? So. Thank you. I have a little clock over here to see when we're turning it over for audience questions. So we're not we're not there yet. Um, so, you know, if you, I guess, like what, in terms of the relationship piece that we've all talked about is so critical for girls that they're so connected to each other, which is so helpful and oftentimes can be really. Um, 
have such a positive impact on development, obviously those relationships can al also be really fraught. And I'm wondering sort of how you see those, the peer relationships sort of either um, like playing into this whole puzzle. I can speak from clinical experience. I think that oftentimes peer relationships um, do represent a source of stress, um, especially when um, there is social media involved. I think that in middle school particularly, um, friendships can be complicated. You know, kind of the ranks of popularity can um, definitely complicate things. I think by giving girls a space to talk about kind of what's going on socially is important. I think providing them with the tools to advocate for themselves and also to acknowledge like what are my values, what is important to me, what do I look for in a friend, how do I want to be a friend is really important to reinforce. Well, the main girls phenomena is real. And I think underneath that is competition on some level. Everybody wants to be included, you know, and when you get into cliques, you know, you're in, I'm, you, I'm in this group and you're not, and these are the rules, and, and when we see it, we need to address it mm -hmm. because it is real, can be very, very damaging, can have lasting negative impacts on people. They can always go back to that period when they felt rejected. We need to be looking at all aspects of diversity in terms of inclusion. Um, uh, you know, children can be very mindful of, uh, when notice it, I mean, mm -hmm. they can be very notice it. So think about that, like even things like uh, uh, name brands and, you know, who, who can afford what, who, you know. Um, all of that can make people feel not good enough, you know. And we all, as human beings, want to be affirmed, want to be accepted, you know, uh, want to be included. So when you see that, then I think it's important to address it, mm. you know. I'm big on groups, actually. And I think uh, actually group psychotherapy can be even m more healing than individual. Mm -hmm. Because in a group, um, you know, you, you're getting support, but you're helping someone else too. It's a dynamic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the group reflects you. And, and, I, and, and it's a lot of empathy in a group because they can gently help mm -hmm. and show you, you know. So just process groups, reflection groups, you know, at the end of every day, have a process group. I'm a psychologist, so I'm big on process. You know? <laughs> How was it? What could we have done better? Yeah. Or like, or, or get, get the students used to like, Okay, it's time to process. Okay, let's stop right now. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about this. Something just happened. What happened right now? Help us understand, you know, yeah. in the moment, the here and the now. Yeah. yeah. I think that's really important to process and also to have that time to reflect and think mm -hmm. about what behaviors could have been different or yes. if I had a chance to rewind, what would I do differently? Yes. I think that's so powerful. And then it actually equips a child or any person for that matter for the next time around they might have that you know, verbiage or new skill set. And we're, we're, we're teaching them how to manage and cope in life. So these skills is, you know, it's for when they are working as professionals. These skills are when they have their own family. These, you know, these skills are when things happen in a community, how to bring a community together. So, you know, when in the educational system, they, they are being given formal knowledge, but they're also being given all this other collateral knowledge of, you know, how to navigate, how to negotiate, how to advocate, how to, you know, and so if we see that as valuing that as all part of their education is to empower them 
of how to be citizens in the world or citizens in the community, et cetera. It's going to take them a long way. So to incorporate that in the curriculum, that that's just as valuable as physics, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, I'm a psychologist, so I'm biased. <laughs> Uh, and you mentioned diversity, and we've been talking about girls, but, and I would love for people to speak on sort of the role of race and sexuality and how identity plays into anxiety. And you know, you touched a little bit on it too, just thinking about where people are feeling safe and unsafe. and past experiences of being in one community and then entering an unknown community um, and how that impacts sort of mental health and well-being. Yeah, I mean, just on kind of a, a, a global or macro level, thinking about it, you know, thinking about when you look at the research on predictors or correlates of anxiety and you look at kind of Shared demographic things like family composition or that it's not very satisfying you know at the end of the day you go well that doesn't really help because it's so context specific mm -hmm. right it's sort of like what's the what's happening in that particular context and what's that person's place in that context and how is that context supporting somebody's experiences and development and how is that context maybe working against them in some pretty profound ways and that all of those things are kind of in the mix when thinking about then how the person's responding or adapting or not or engaging with that sort of environment. So I think the, you know, who one is and the environment that one is in and what that fit is there and how supportive the environment is um, really makes a difference in terms of helping, you know, thinking about how people experience anxiety and what drives anxiety. And that's the much more, I think, real and interesting stuff than sort of this group or that. You know, it's, it's like what's the, the, the fit and the um, responsiveness and how welcoming is the environment that you're in to who you are and what you bring to the table is that environment. Um, do you get a seat at the table in that environment or are you marginalized and off to the side? And um, you know, If you're marginalized and off to the side, that's a pretty tough road um, to mm -hmm. hoe. Um, so, right. so I think those kinds of factors make a difference. Definitely. And it's dynamic too uh, because um, as an African-American woman who works at college, people know me, I've been there for a long time. You know, I have a doctorate, I have a lot of privilege, but it's all contextual because if I go into Natick at a, at, um, you know, at a store, I'm just a black woman, <laughs> you know? None of that matters. And so we go in and out of uh, experiences of privilege and non-privilege all day long and we manage that you know the important thing is that we want our children to have a, a coarse strong sense of self and self-esteem that who they are they can hold on to that regardless of the context and the situations that you're in and regardless of how other people perceive you or what they may attribute to you you want your child to be able to uh, hold on to who they are and feel good about themselves regardless of the waters mm -hmm. that they're in, regardless of how troubled the water's in. And the thing is, that's why home is so important, and particularly if, if a uh, student's in a residential school, their, their home becomes their residence hall or the room that they're in. So we all go into the world and we, there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot of trauma in the world. It's, it's not a little. And then, but you need to come home for respite. Mm -hmm. Respite. You can just relax, be yourself. You know, take off your shoes. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and, and, and fill yourself back up because you get deplete, you know, depleted. Mm -hmm. you, and then now you can go back out and navigate. It's a backwards and a forward. It's, you know, nothing static here. You know? yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, we would love, we know all of you have really thoughtful, interesting questions and would love to hear from any of you who want to ask questions to our panel. If you want to direct things to anyone in particular or to everybody, I think people are walking around with mics. So anyone wants to raise a hand.
about um, val when, when a child is stressed about validating their about validating their feelings. Um, one of my questions would be, if you don't necessarily agree or you don't understand, how do you make that authentic and not so that you're just talk, you know, talking nonsense to them that they're going to shut down anyway? Yeah, no, that's a great question. That's a great question. So um, I should have said this earlier. Validation doesn't mean agreement, right? We don't have to understand it. We don't have to agree what a child's doing. Um, I find it's most helpful to kind of, when a child, let's say, is tantruming or in distress, to mindfully observe what's going on and to either mind read and accurately reflect, like I can tell that this is really overwhelming. Kind of label what you're seeing. And then if you're not quite sure if your child or teen says, well, that's not how I feel, sometimes it's helpful to say, did I get that right? It feels like this is really overwhelming. Did I get that right? And I find that that's really helpful because in those tense moments, it can de-escalate. It can allow you to pivot and offer a coping strategy. Um, because I find like if we were to ask a, lot, a series of questions, well, what's wrong? What's going on? likely you're going to get heightened emotion. And then sometimes that's not very productive. And I think you're validating the, the feeling of your child being, they truly are in distress or they're so upset, not that, you know, this part, you know, you don't have to agree like, yes, not being invited to this party was the worst thing that ever happened. But like, I can tell that it feels so upsetting. It feels like, you, re you feel really excluded or whatever it was rather than, you know, joining them on that actual event. The that's other, a great question. The other thing that's helpful too is sometimes it's really difficult to validate thoughts or comments that are not grounded in reality. And so I find that it's helpful to say like, wow, that must really stink to have that thought or to be thinking this way. Right, to acknowledge that they are in pain, even if that thought isn't necessarily valid. Right? If, they, my, if a child says, I have no friends, and you know that they do have friends. And you can say, like, why, why, why do you say you have no friends? Mm -hmm. Help me understand why you feel you have no friends. And then, then they go deeper, and then they're articulated to another degree. So to not assume you know what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you may know what a word means, but say, what does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Help me understand. Mm -hmm. Because you, you want to understand their perspective. Yeah. And for better or worse, most adolescents are very kind of in the moment and short set, and things feel really, really important. And even though as adults we might know things will pass, it's very real to them. You know, I was sitting with a patient last night who said to Zach, don't tell me this won't matter. In five years, it matters to me now. So just that sense of like, you know, identifying with that. Thank you. Um, I have more of a, a comment than a question. And I just want to thank the panel for educating me. Because your comments have made me sit down and say, that's my daughter. My daughter is the one who wants everybody to like her. She cares that her teacher likes her. She cares that her principal likes her. And if I say some, if I will say, well, if you don't do this, I'll tell your principal. She said, please don't do that because then she won't like me. So um, she is, I can see she's hypersensitive about people liking her. So in the fall, I'll be going through the process of looking at schools for her, Dana Hall being one of them. And she, um, and, she said to, and she said to me, well, how about if they don't like me? Um, and I said, well, Jesse, you're, 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 you know, I tried to say, Jesse, you're great. Everybody likes you. But still, she's so hypersensitive of, pe of people liking her, of doing things so people will like her even more. So, and I, I, I kind of feel like from what I, from, well, I just want to say thank you for educating me. And I also feel that, uh, you know, my daughter is, 
a person of color and the schools that I'm looking at for her, um, she will be a minority. So, and now I'm hypersensitive about that and what that dynamic might look for her in regards of people liking her because my daughter has, sometimes has extensions, sometimes has braids in her hair, and I'm hypersensitive of what people say, why does she look so different? Mm -hmm. So, and I know she'll be hypersensitive, you know, if, if you know, God willing, she's accepted into a great school of not only people liking me, but like physically of what I look, of what I look like, because I'll be so different compared to everybody else. But thank you for educating me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment and for sharing that. And I'd love to take some time to just respond a little bit and give some support. Mm -hmm. And for, how old is your daughter? She, she's eight and she'll be nine in the summer. Okay, so does anyone want to speak to some of the um, both uh, being a student of color in a predominantly white community or, and or being eager to be liked. Anyone want to take that sure. up? Uh, well, you're going to explore these various schools, right? Your daughter's going to be with you. Very important for her to be with you. And um, I like journaling. So I, I would go to a bookstore and pick out a, a journal that you and put, and you can label it like, what school feels right for me? Then when she goes to the schools, put the pros, the cons, and do that for each one, and then sit down and have a discussion. I would talk with the administrators very openly about the issues of diversity, see if there are people there who your daughter could connect with other students in the school. Um, at to, you know, I don't know if you all do sleepovers. Do they do sleepovers when they come? <laughs> they don't do, y'all don't do sleepovers. Okay. So in college, they do <laughs> sleepovers. <laughs> oh, That's a little different. But to just have an open, an open conversation about it. We do learn ways to cope as people of color. I remember when I was going through my educational process, I felt like no one was going to choose me to be in the group. So I just did my thing. Then when they found out I was smart, they wanted me in the group. <laughs> but I, but I, I found a way to sit back for a moment. That was my coping mechanism, you know, that I reflected on later. I would sit back and then I'd let them pick me because I didn't want to not be chosen or to be, be rejected, you know. Um, so I would do a little little journal, and I think journals are good anyway because you process. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're you're getting the thoughts out of your head onto a paper. It's also is data, and it's a log, and you can go back and reflect on them, and then you can figure out what got you through, what worked back then. So I, I would make it like a a little interesting exercise that we're going to do together. And then that's a transferable skill. And we want to teach our children transferable skills that it works in this situation and you can use it later in life. That increases their level of coping and different options. But we want them to love themselves first. You know, you know, you, you want other people to like you, but, but you want them to like themselves too. I just wrote, I wrote, I like myself. Yeah, so I would say, yes, I think a couple of things. First of all, I think what Robin said was so powerful about being, it sounds like you've been so thoughtful and deliberate about thinking about a community where your daughter is gonna feel validated and safe and being transparent with her too. And then as you're looking at places, asking her and talking about, you know, what will it feel like for her to be one of the only students of color? What support do you have in place? Like Robin was saying, just make it, it sounds like that's already something you're so um, just aware of and not making that a secret from your daughter. She knows what her experience will be. And then I also might just explore in terms of the wanting to be liked a little bit of like, well, what would it mean if somebody didn't like you? And would, might that be okay? And you know, 
if that child didn't like you, could you play with somebody else during recess? Or kind of exploring that like she will be, a, there may be a kid or a teacher somewhere down the line that doesn't like her, even though I'm sure she's so likable. <laughs> but that she will be OK with that, and that she is like, you know, she can love herself, and that if there are people along the way, that she does, that she can sort of like try to focus on the relationships that are filling her up and the relationships where she knows without it being too complicated that that friend does like her rather than being worried about the people who might not. That's a, that's a great discussion. So I would like to ask the panel what they recommend to help kids who, whose primary source of anxiety trigger is their own self-performance, where they feel that they have to perform better, and that triggers them to perform worse. Mm, great question. Good question. I, I think this is one of the central issues in sort of high achieving, high performing sorts of environments. Is there is a sense of that's what makes you who you are. Is so just thinking very about poignantly what Robin was talking about at the beginning of the panel, panel about arriving at Wellesley and finding all these other people, mm -hmm. right, who are performing and then where do I, now where am I in the pecking order and how do I manage that? But I think that that, um, you know, I think it's in the water that we're drinking and the air that we're breathing right now, this sense of we are what we do um, and that young people are picking up on that and they're picking up on these signals in all kinds of places. And I think we have to actively counteract that message and it's not to say that there's something wrong with being invested in your performance, right? It's not to, to pathologize that or make that a bad thing, but rather to balance that with other things. So the performance can't be the only thing in your life. There, it has to be balanced by other things and the ways in which the environments that young people are in can help that happen by creating opportunities, modeling that, insisting on it in some ways. Again, in that study that we did, I'll never forget one young um, woman who said uh, that her mother really helped her by saying she can no longer study after a certain time at night. She's done. Regardless of what she's completed, regardless of what grade she thinks she's going to get, she's done and it's time to go to sleep because sleep is as important as anything else in her life. So the, at the times it takes an adult intervention to help structure that drive for performance. I think there's a sense of it's, it's so rewarded. Um, you, it's gratified because you get the great grade. It's gratified because you please that teacher. It's gratified because your parent might be happy. Um, your friends are now in awe of you because you're a super person. And there's so much gratification for that, that to find ways to counterbalance that with other messages. And at times, uh, you know, I think this is again where I think adults have to intervene and insist on other kinds of activities and other forms of work. It, I just think it's so important in this age that um, young people are valued for, that we value well-being at yes. least as much as we're valuing achievement. And it just feels like the scales are really tipped. And I think it's a real setup for our um, young people in terms of moving into adulthood. It's not like the pressure is going to decrease, right? It's not like the forces are going to ease up mm -hmm. in terms of performance. I was thinking, um, I was reminded of, you know, the early days when all this technology and media and kind of always being on was a new thing. <laughs> like, I'm old enough to remember when that was like a brand new idea that you're always opportunity, you know, you can always be plugged in. And there was a commentator um, I heard on NPR one day who said basically, it's not turning off. So there will not be an external off button to this. It's up to us to figure out when we're going to engage or not with media. And I'm thinking if there's a similar sort of thing in these high performing environments, that there has to be a way to build in the ability to turn it off, or at least turn it down and amplify other things as well. And it's not easy. I'm not trying to make it sound like, oh, this is so easy, and you can do you know, it's not. Mm -hmm. and again, in part because the rewards are so great at all levels, at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, and at the societal level. Um, it's just so richly rewarded. But you know, I, I think it comes at such a high price to all of us. Um, and you know, most especially to these developing minds and bodies and growing spirits that we have, um, that when so much is invested in their performance, I think we're really losing um, what they're going to have to offer down the road. They won't be uh, put together and functioning well enough to really um, you know, create the kind of society I think we want to live in. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, if I could just maybe 
push a little bit more on what you're suggesting. Um, I would agree that the work you do is to help young people build skills to deal with the expectations. And those expectations are created somewhere, and I would argue by those of us who raise them in the institutions um, that they find themselves educated in. And I guess I would say, would your advice be to start changing the paradigm of what we reward, even at the schools you represent? So by and large, we reward by admission, um, by maybe awards at the end of schools, high performance. We don't typically admit to high, highly selective schools, kids who say, well, I actually like rest an hour and a half a day. Um, <laughs> you know, and I go for walks. Um, could you, would your advice be to institutions to really think carefully about what we allow our young people to do? How many APs do we let them take? Um, how many, you know, electives, or excuse me, clubs and um, leadership positions do we let them handle? Because I think at some level, until we stop the craziness by stopping rewarding the craziness, the kids are gonna keep doing what they actually perceive is being asked of them. So I, I don't know if the, you feel the conversations at higher ed are gonna push the secondary schools and the middle schools to rethink the, the kids that we're creating because we like those kids, I mean, at, at some level. Yeah, yeah. and the, the um, college admissions race, and it really is a race, right? It's, it's just, it's crazy kind of what, what is, um, what the profile is. And I think we have to have frank conversations with our young people about if they're aspiring to these most elite colleges, there's an element of lottery luck now at this point. I mean, the admission rates are infinitesimal. Um, it's a really big shift. And so the notion that you're getting in because you're the best is ridiculous. You're amongst a lot of really fantastic people who got rejected. You know, so it, 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 there is, there's, a, there's a sense of what, how we used to think of the, um, I think Harvard's down to less than 2% admission of number, you know, the percentage of people who apply who get in. This is wildly different than when, you know, in, in my generation when we were applying to colleges. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be having frank conversations with young people about this. So if, you're, if that's your goal, at what cost and what's your backup plan? <laughs> You know, and and what uh, what are the other sources of meaning? What and what is admission to the? We we sort of hold these institutions up on this um, pedestal as if they're they're imbued with a particular kind of meaning. And I think it's really important to have frank conversations with young people about what is that? What is it you're trying to achieve? And you know, talking to young people about the fit between themselves and the yes. educational mm -hmm. institution that they're considering. That's what it is. And the Robin's advice about the middle school, same thing at the college. Like, visit it. Is it a place you really mm -hmm. want to be? Harvard's a great fit for some young people. It's a terrible fit for a lot of young people, and they'll sink there, not because they're not smart, but because it's a terrible environment for them. So I think it's just, uh, in many levels, I think there's a lot we can be doing to combat and work against this. I recommend a book for those in the college admissions race. There's a great book, Frank Bruni, the New York Times commentator, called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be. And he just a ton of information about what the admission, you know, what this, what those numbers really look like today. It's sobering, and I think it's really important for us to know that so we don't set up this false sense that you got in because you're so great. You know, it's like it's it's reifying all of this in the sense of yeah, you're great. Lots of people are great, and lots of people who didn't get in are really really great. And there's lots of places you can go and be really really great. Um, and not kind of reifying these messages. I think the, you know, us as adults and all of the roles that we play with young people have a lot that we could be doing to help them to counteract these messages and help them kind of navigate this in a healthier way. And can I just add, and do we need a trophy for everything that they do? <laughs> and do preschools need to wear caps and gowns when they go to preschool? I mean, I know they look cute, but what, but what, you know, what are they aspiring to? Um, so we do need to, we do need to reflect on that. I do think colleges now are looking at that because they can't keep up with the mental health needs and demands. So the colleges are now thinking about well-being, wellness, balance. And I do think if someone writes in an admissions essay how they take care of their, themselves, I bet it will be looked at now in a different mm -hmm. kind of way. Um, and the thing is, um, you know, th there is um, uh, mental disorders, bipolar disorder, clinical depression, generalized anxiety disorder, 
and their psychological issues that impact you that's not diagnosed. In the moment, it all feels the same, whether or not it's a diagnosed condition. In the moment, that's what they experience. So you, so you cannot, there's no, there's no way you can staff a counseling service at a college to deal with all that. You have to shift the context. You have to shift the ways of being so that those other things are addressed in normative kinds of way. So I do think they are really looking at uh, the cost and benefits of that. The tides are beginning to turn. We're, not, we're nowhere near that, but I do think they're beginning to turn. We have not learned how to wait. You know, you used to write a letter, put it in the mail, and it took like four or five days to get there. <laughs> and you know, the benefit is you could read that letter over and over again and get joy over it. Emails quick, tick, gone. You know, a Snapchat, gone. You know, and, and we haven't learned how to like wait and sit and B, and we've got to go back to some of those, those values. We're, you're right, technology isn't going anywhere, but now we have to learn how to kind of manage it a little bit better now that it's here. So, you know, we weren't prepared for that, but now that it's here, we see the benefits. Like I said, some great benefits, but now what are the downsides and how are we going to balance that, you know? I think we have time for one more question. It's, in, it's important. <laughs> so I, I was just curious, I think when you were saying um, the stressors the girls had, and I'm, I guess more, I'm thinking more like maybe when they're in older high school, were, did anything come up with girls about sort of the added stressors that boys generally don't have to deal with, like self-care, um, you know, the, the worries of, you know, going to a bar and worrying what you're, you know, getting into an Uber, how much you drink, so many more things that girls have to be, you know, having children and thinking of that in terms of the context of your career choices. I wonder, do girls think of those things in high school or is that something like that comes later in life and does that add to any of the stresses that they're encountering? That's such a good question. I, you guys from your clinical experience can probably speak. I will say in the interviews that we did, we the, the um, boys came up surprisingly little. I'll say it's one of the things that we sort of, it wasn't offered up as a topic in all sorts of ways, in ways that I was sort of surprised by, but neither did we ask a whole lot about that. That really wasn't sort of the focus. And, um, uh, and they also weren't offering up this kind of critique about what it means to be a girl or a woman in today's world and kind of the multiple pressures in the um, structural sense of it, right? Like more the interpersonal sense, but not the, that kind of structural analysis that you're doing. So we weren't hearing in the interviews, we also didn't design them to really pull for that, but I think the question's really interesting and I'm wondering in your practice if you're hearing that kind of critical analysis, which I think is so important. Um, I know that in my work with many high school students and college age students that is coming up in terms of having worries, um, particularly worries that are centered around the future and there's just extra worries about how they are interacting with their peers. That seems very different than their male counterparts. Um, I think for many of the high school students particularly, there's a lot of social anxiety and social concerns about how they present, how they'll be perceived, um, next steps in terms of, well, when, once I get to this college, then what will happen after this? Or if I don't choose the right major, then I'm setting myself up for, um, you know, the rest of my life has to look a certain way. And so that's, I don't know, I would imagine in your work that. Yeah, well, you know, I work with, Females yeah. for a long time, so I, 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 although I have a son, I have a whole. But anyway, um, I think what we hear is that the students really like being able to be in an achievement place where they don't have to worry about bells. Mm -hmm. They can just roll out of bed and go to class. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, they feel like it's, they don't have the competition, or they don't feel that the. Um, I heard a student come back in a counseling session who had gone to a conference and really saw what 
she was getting being at an all-female college because she says they talked all the time. They dominated the conversation. This one person talked the whole time through. He knew, thought he knew all of this and that. And I'm glad I don't have to deal with all of that, you know. So, um, so I think they understand the benefit that they're getting, that they can just learn and engage and not have that dynamic that they're dealing with and that they can put that aside and choose to deal with it when, when they want to. I also hear a lot about the disconnect be, or the conflict between their goals and their life and the parents. Mm -hmm. You know, what the parents want, the parents' cultural belief, the parents' religious belief, that the, the parents be around gender and who they should love and not love. And like, you know, being in a space where now they have freedom and they can choose and now they got to go home. That's what I'm hearing now. People are going back home mm -hmm. for the summer. I'm losing my freedom. I can't. I can't be myself anymore. I got to be back in a box again and, and all of that, you know. So, like, like many of us have said, it's... My daughter we're, we're, actually goes to public school. That's why I'm asking, because yeah. I, I, she doesn't go to an all-girls school. So I'm asking more in the context of... Um, mm -hmm. yeah. that, it was a very... I was struggling whether to send her to an all-girls school mm -hmm. or it's just, we go. We live in a very good community, but it's, it's challenging, right? Because of the day you're going to be dealing with the men and the, and the world mm -hmm. at large is and I think it's back to like the right tricky. fit for each kid it's back right, to the right, right fit yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, that, I'm so glad you, you should yeah. ask that question that's a great question um, so unfortunately I think our time is up yes thank you um, panelists once again Thank you all for coming, and I'd like to um, give a special thank you to Rob Mather, who's our assistant head of school, who arranged the entire evening. We got our panelists. And thank you to everybody who came out this evening to do an extra evening's work. So thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.